Skin is not a solid substance. It is made up of cells and layers. If you press the skin down with enough weight, the fibers of fabric can become entwined in the skin. This doesn't happen with every fiber or every boundary of skin cells, but it can happen enough that it appears that the two are intertwined. This is especially true if the weight pressure on the skin exists over an extended period of time. This is what journalist Siglu wrote in the Mysteries Unsolved blog to describe what happened to Gail Grinds, a 480-pound woman from Florida. In 2004, Gail was found in her home with her flesh literally fused to the fabric of her couch, leading to a several-hour-long rescue attempt, an attempt that was ultimately unsuccessful. And although this disturbing situation is a bit unusual, it's far from one of a kind. So today, let's take a look at some people whose skin literally fused to their seats. This video is sponsored by Incogni. Your personal data is worth a lot of money. And no matter how careful you are, it just seems to get out there. Like every other day, you're hearing about some kind of new data breach. You got these companies called data brokers that collect information about you, like your name, address, sometimes even your social security number. You have a legal right to demand that these companies remove that information, but they make the process as difficult as possible. That's where Incogni comes in. Incogni helps protect your privacy by reaching out to these companies on your behalf, requesting the removal of your data and dealing with their objections. As Incogni does its thing, you'll get a list of these companies, how sensitive the data they have is, and how far along in the process Incogni is. When I first spoke about Incogni back in December, I had mentioned how it seemed like almost every single phone call I ever got was some kind of spam advertisement or a scam. In the time since I've been using Incogni, I've been getting significantly less of these phone calls. I can't remember the last time I picked up the phone and there was some guy talking Chinese at me. Go to Incogni.com slash Wang. And use code Wang and you'll get an exclusive offer for 60% off. That's incogni.com slash Wang and use code Wang or click the link below to take your personal data off the market. In my old videos, people used to always ask me why I was standing at my desk. I had a standing desk set up because I was very concerned about correcting my posture. A day later on, studies came out that sitting too many hours a day can lead to cancer, diabetes, heart disease. And that's even if you're otherwise fit and active. Of course, now I'm sitting at this desk because I don't feel like standing anymore. But that's neither here nor there. The stories I'm going to tell you about today, it takes a lot more than a few hours a day to get to that point. Like, so long that you have to wonder how it's even physically possible. Let's start with the story of Gail Laverne Grinds. A tragic tale by all accounts. On August 10th of 2004, Gail's brother Clifford called 911 reporting that Gail had emphysema and she was struggling to breathe. The rescue workers were absolutely not prepared for what they'd see when they arrived. The Martin County Sheriff's Sergeant Janelle Atlas told the Palm Beach Post, We are used to going to people's houses when things are at their worst. And that's fine. We're trained for it. But there is no warning for something like this. The first thing that hit them was the smell. It was so bad that they needed extra safety gear and air hoses to take out the bad air and put in some good air. And when they got inside, there was garbage all over the floors. Furniture was knocked down and pictures have fallen from the wall and clearly laid there for a very long time. Worst of all, every surface, the walls, the floors, everything, was caked in feces. Layers upon layers of old, dried feces. And then they discovered Gail. Seated in her couch, the 39-year-old woman was 480 pounds at only 4 foot 10. They tried to get her up from the couch, but she was in excruciating pain that worsened every time they tried to move her. According to the man who lived with her and claimed to be her husband, Herman Thomas, Gail had apparently been seated in that position for six years straight. He tearfully claimed that he'd tried to pull her off, but she just didn't want to leave. And even if she would let him, he probably couldn't have. You see, over the course of those six years, her skin had become fused to the material of the couch, and the rescue workers weren't having much more luck moving her themselves. So they decided that they would have to bring her to the hospital with the couch still attached to have it surgically removed. And then the construction begins. You see, there's just no way that you're going to get a woman that size with an entire couch stuck to her onto a normal stretcher. So they set up shop outside her house and with hammers and chainsaws built a larger wooden stretcher. 
and after trying a bunch of different approaches to get her out, they soon learned that they can't get her outside. They had to remove her patio doors to create a six-foot opening larger enough to get her out. Of course, she also wouldn't fit in the ambulance, so they had to load her onto a trailer attached to a pickup truck. And then finally, they begin driving to the hospital at 2 a.m., six hours after the rescue attempt began. And while this is all going on, the neighbors start to gather and watch. In all these years, they had no idea that a woman lived there. They thought it was just the old man by himself, and occasionally they would see some young girls. Those being Gail's nieces that she was supposed to be taking care of after her sister died. Unfortunately, all this effort was for naught, as Gail would die an hour later. Still attached to the couch, with her official cause of death listed as morbid obesity. The sheriff's office commented, Sheriff's investigators questioned how Grimes lived in such conditions without more help from family or authorities. We're not treating her death as suspicious at this point, but we do have an investigation started because the circumstances surrounding her death are so unusual. In these cases, there's often a question of who's responsible, or if there's cause for anyone to be held accountable at all. And there's a lot of factors that can make it difficult to judge. For example, you also have the story of the woman who was found stuck to a toilet seat. In February of 2008, Corey McFarren called 911, where he's connected to the Ness County Sheriff's Office in western Kansas. He told them that they had to come to his home because something was wrong with his girlfriend. When rescue workers arrived, they're hit with what Sheriff Brian Whipple described as an overpowering smell. It's permeating throughout the whole house, getting more and more intense as they get closer to the bathroom where they ultimately found his girlfriend, Pam Babcock. She's sitting on the toilet where she'd apparently been two years straight. I've seen a lot of people have some kind of perma toilet as part of their dream gaming setup, but there was no gaming going on here. It was just all bathroom living all the time. How does one survive in a bathroom for two years? Corey said that he would bring her food and water, and every day he'd ask her to come out of the bathroom and she would say, maybe tomorrow. Over the course of these two years, open sores had formed, and these sores caused her skin to actually grow around the toilet seat. And even in these conditions, when they showed up, she insisted that she was fine and didn't need help. She was refusing to leave the bathroom, let alone go to the hospital. But thankfully, after a long back and forth, the rescue workers were finally able to convince her to go. But of course, now she's stuck to the toilet seat and they can't just bring the whole toilet. So they had to get a pry bar and remove the seat from the toilet with her attached to it. And then they brought her to the hospital where the seat was surgically removed from her. Due to nerve damage from an infection in her legs, doctors reported that she would probably never walk again. And the focus then shifted to her boyfriend, Corey, as investigators were trying to figure out whether or not he had actually committed a crime here. In particular, they were concerned with why he waited so long to call 911. His explanation was this was a situation that came on gradually and got worse over time. They had been dating at that point for 16 years. And Pam had a traumatic childhood. Her mother died in an early age, and she was severely beaten growing up. A neighbor who had known her since childhood said that she was rarely allowed to leave the house. And eventually this leaves her with a fear of going outside, that eventually manifests in her not even wanting to leave the bathroom. Corey explained how it happened. The 36-year-old antique store worker insists the odd arrangement simply evolved over time, and it got to the point where he no longer thought of it as strange. It kind of just happened one day. She went in and had been in there a little while. The next time it was a little longer. Then she got it in her head she was going to stay. Like it was a safe place for her, he outlines. At first she was still bathing, changing her clothes, eating food, even having normal, full conversations with Corey. At least as normal as only having conversations with someone in the bathroom can be. It was only a month before the call that the situation worsened. That was when she would not get up from the toilet at all. What ultimately prompted Corey's call was that a day prior she had become what was described as listless and groggy, likely due to the infection. Despite the staff noting that neither Corey nor Pam seemed mentally well, and despite Pam insisting that this wasn't Corey's fault, Corey was charged with mistreatment of a dependent adult, and after pleading no contest, he was given six months on probation. That wasn't the worst of it, though. You see, Corey had another unrelated court appearance that same day, in which he was given six months of jail time for exposing himself to their neighbor. The next story is perhaps one of the most infamous Reddit tales. Actually, the story that inspired me to go down this whole rabbit hole to begin with. In August of 2012, Banzai Panda, who you might remember as the nurse behind the Swamps of Dagobah story, creates an Ask Me Anything thread because there's a lot of demand to see what else she's seen. In the thread, a user named JQ Public doesn't have a question, but her story reminded him of something. JQ wasn't a nurse, but he worked for an emergency mental health unit. 
In general, most of his work had to do with domestic disputes and preventing self-harm. One night, he receives a call from someone who had a friend that knew this guy that other people were worried about. He asks his routine questions about self-harm and whether or not the person in question is willing to see them. But they weren't really getting the information they needed as the guy on the phone seemed a bit confused, perhaps a bit drunk himself. The person of concern was a long-term alcoholic, and the friend was a person who had been going shopping for him, mostly for beer. Originally, they weren't going to go as there was no threat of immediate self-harm. Even though the my girlfriend's crazy types wanted us to be the mental health police, we were quite clear on the need for the client to agree to speak with us. Something about the call was troubling him though, so after discussing it with his partner, they decided they're just going to go to the house and give the door a knock, and they could see if the man was willing to talk to them. By the time they get there, they find that the police and the EMTs are already on the scene. They go up to them to find out what's going on, but the conversation is interrupted by, once again, the smell. The original caller, oh my god what a surprise, was not actually the friend of a friend who knows a guy who, etc., but the person who'd been buying the beer for our client, whom we still have not seen. As we are standing outside this guy's house, getting background information, the wind shifts slightly. The house is close to an abattoir, so I didn't think too much of it at first until I noticed the cops and paramedics quickly move away from the front of the house we're supposed to be going into. The beer buyer turns a little gray, and his support team quickly fade. He's gone right afterwards. The paramedics are getting ready to go in by slapping on two layers of medical gloves and smearing something that looks like Vicks Vaporub on their upper lips. I grew up on a farm and have had to deal with some pretty stinky things, so I figured I'd be okay. Let me tell you though, that Vicks Vaporub. One time my bad Jenks was playing this venue where the septic system was leaking out into the walls, and it stunk. We kept some Vicks Vapor up by the merch table, and it really does come in handy. Still, it wasn't enough for JQ Public's partner, who refused to go inside. Finally, he knocks on the door and hears a voice very weakly say, Come in. At this point, he gets some more background to what had been going on. The old man in the building had been an alcoholic for 30 years, and the past year had been extra bad. His neighbor, who was the caller, had been getting groceries and beer for this whole time and was feeling guilty for enabling him, as well as lying about how much beer costs and pocketing the difference. The kitchen is full of a year's worth of uneaten groceries. He notes that some of the grocery bags are moving. They're all rotting and the bugs are having themselves a feast. He sees the back of the old man's head, seated on the couch next to a pile of empty beer bottles that go higher than the couch. And he realized from the shape of the pile that gradually the guy had probably shifted from one side of the couch to the other. The entire bathroom was clogged and full of rotting shit. And between the bathroom and the couch, there is what he described as not a line, but a pathway of shit. Of course, the couch is also completely caked in it. Dry shit, but if Dexter had been around and had been more into shit than blood, he would have loved that couch. Splatter patterns everywhere, including, as I realized once my eyes had adjusted to the light in the room, over top of the bottles. The man is in a daze staring at the TV, completely oblivious to the strangers in his house standing around him. But his gaze is broken after a cop turns the TV off. And then JQ Public is able to ask him the normal questions he asks about the guy's mental health. But it's going nowhere as the guy is clearly just not there. So he has to go outside and discuss with the team what to do next. One of the cops asks, do you think there's a possibility of a medical emergency here? Which the, the answer to that question is so obvious that everyone starts laughing a bit. But it's one of those things that they legally have to do to be able to bring the guy to the hospital. And then it happens, and be warned, this is some of the most gross text ever put to Reddit. And now the payoff. The old guy's been in that one spot long enough that his shit and piss have more or less melted the fabric and foam he's been sitting on, and his clothing, skin, ass, back, and thigh flesh have all necrotized, and the rot from that has mixed in with the couch so that it's hard to tell which is which. There were chunks of bone visible. Long strips of rotting flesh and colors I hope to never see again. The smell of it. One of the paras had a spray can in his hand, and the second the old man got up, he sprayed the couch, not the client, which stopped us from vomiting all over the patient. We lay him face down on the gurney, or whatever it's properly called, they tossed some gauze over his ass, and wheeled him out of there. They didn't even try to separate what was man from what was couch bits. The paramedics figured he'd been sitting there at least a month or so. The cops were still outside trying to figure out what they should be doing, and the only thing I could think of was for them to lock up. They did. We left, and I never found out if the client survived or not. But I don't think I'll forget the smell or the sight of what was left of him. The worst of all of it, the look in his eyes when I asked him if he understood why we were here. Hollow, 
dead flat eyes with someone screaming behind them. That and my partner telling me I stuck up the van as we drove back. I have no idea how that man could still be alive when he stood up. It looked like half of him had simply rotted off. It's a story that's been recounted time and time again on Reddit. And in some of these posts, other Redditors chimed in with similar stories. Like you have Mr. Poopy Butthole, who wrote of a 600 pound man in his hometown who had grown to his recliner. He died a week after being separated from it, and supposedly being melted to the chair kept him alive. Separating him from it ultimately led to his death. And you have the rowing maniac who writes of how his own brother was going down the same path, despite their father's work involved in cleaning up these sorts of situations. But thankfully, he had been taking better care of himself lately. Perhaps the most tragic of all the stories I'd seen looking into this topic, though, is the story of Lacey Fletcher. On January 3rd of 2022, Lacey Fletcher's parents, Clay and Sheila, called 911. They reported that their daughter Lacey wasn't breathing. Rescue workers arrived once again to that textbook stench. And once they got inside, they discovered the 36-year-old Lacey Fletcher dead. Her body fused to her family's couch. She had weighed only 96 pounds and was covered in sores. Some of them down to the bone and infested with maggots. Old human waste was stuck all over her body, including her face. It was said that she had not been outside of their home in 15 years. And a lot of people had no idea that her parents even had a daughter. And people who did know her when she was a child just assumed she grew up and moved away. Initially, it was reported that Lacey suffered from something called locked-in syndrome. Locked-in syndrome is a condition in which all of your voluntary muscles, except the ones that control your eyes, are paralyzed. But mentally, you're still completely there. Essentially, you're a prisoner in your own body. So it appears at first that you have Lacey enduring over a decade of abuse and neglect by her parents. All the while, she's completely conscious of it and unable to do anything about it. But the coroner who ruled the death a homicide disagreed. I don't know where that term came from or what source it came from. In all my years as a practicing physician, I have never heard of that term. The only diagnoses that I know she did have was first social anxiety, severe autism, and that's it. Those are her only two diagnoses. It is a little strange considering locked-in syndrome is something that, while it's rare, it is a real thing that's recognized. But in any case, the evidence does point to the fact that she didn't have locked-in syndrome. In particular, the feces and couch foam that were found in her stomach, which she would not have been able to swallow had she had that syndrome. So how do things get to this point for a girl who's remembered as extremely intelligent and her parents who are thought to be kind-hearted, selfless pillars of the community? As the parents tell it, it's shockingly similar to the toilet bowl story I talked about before. It began around ninth grade. Lacey begins to have severe social anxiety and she's diagnosed with autism. It's decided that homeschooling would be best for her. She would still leave the house at that point. Neighbors mentioned they would always see her outside working out. And at some point in 2000, she began working with a psychiatrist to deal with social issues. But by 2010 or so, she began to refuse to leave the couch. Her parents had spoken to a psychiatrist about what to do about this, and he told them that they had to bring her to a hospital to be evaluated. But they never brought her to the hospital. Instead, they simply began to accommodate this behavior. They would bring her meals to the couch, and they would bring her towels to use instead of the toilet, because she wouldn't even get up to go to the bathroom. But in their minds, she was capable of making these kinds of decisions for herself. They were so convinced that they were doing the right thing that they were the ones who called 911 thinking there wouldn't be consequences for them. Actually, while I was working on this video, I saw Dr. Todd Grande put out a video on this case going um, in depth into what might have been going on mentally there and what possible motives might have been. Definitely worth looking at if you want to look more into the psychological aspect of this story. In any case, the parents were brought up on murder charges, but the case was thrown out because of a technical issue. This past June, however, though, they were arrested again and indicted. And as of me recording this video, they're out on bond and awaiting trial. I think when you hear of stories like this in passing, where someone died of sitting too long, so long that their bodies literally fused with the chairs they're sitting in, I think the initial assumption before you look into the stories is like, oh, this person's lazy and sloppy. They let it happen to themselves. But when you really look at them, it seems like almost every single one of these cases, it's a sad story of a person with severe mental issues and their support system failing them. But at the same time, if you're a person around this, it's difficult to figure out what to do. And perhaps it's surprisingly easy to convince yourself that there isn't a problem until it's too big to ignore. And by then, it's too late. Anyway, that's all for now. If you like this video, check out my video about the swamps of Dagobah. I'm out.